people from outside the IF team. So let me just, uh, uh, okay, first of all, welcome you to the uh, ISTP Safer, uh, which is organizing this uh, interesting event of a uh, one week uh, long mini course. Uh, just a few practical things. Uh, there are desks on the first floor in case you want to stay here and work. Uh, uh, so it should be nice there. And there will be also be lockers outside here if you need to use them, uh, say to leave your things for lunch or whatever. You should uh, talk to the, uh, the secretaries and they will give you a, a key and explain how this works. Um, I also wanted to, to say that, um, so, uh, the, the idea of a, of a mini course is also to, to give you the opportunity to, to interact with uh, the professor. And in particular, uh, there are a number of exercises that are part of the uh, published uh, lecture notes. And I just want to say that I really encourage you to work on those. It's a great way to uh, get, have questions and be able to take most of, uh, advantage of, uh, of this uh, week. Okay, so I think, uh, I hope most of you are already old enough to realize that if you don't sit down and do things, even if you have the, the best lecture in front of you, it, it just uh, doesn't work. So anyway, so I just, uh, so we are really uh, happy to uh, have a uh, professor Ilya Shapiro uh, from the University of uh, uh, Ruiz de Fora, uh, who agreed to give this uh, interesting mini course. I'm sure you already uh, know uh, Professor Shapiro, but uh, so let me just emphasize that he's really a world expert in these uh, uh, topics that he's going to cover. Of course, in one week, you cannot expect to cover, uh, you can cover only a portion, but that's why I'm emphasizing that you should really take advantage and ask all the questions you, you you have to either during the lectures or uh, afterwards. So with that, I think we can just uh, allow Professor Shapiro to start his uh, lectures. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank very much Jessica and Eduardo for organizing these uh, uh, lectures because I wanted, always wanted to give lectures in EFT. And actually the story started 22 years ago when Rogerio uh, invited me here for seminar because somebody asked him to invite me for seminar. No, no. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is true. And uh, it was because I had laptop with this screen. It was very expensive, and it needed to be fixed. So I asked it to find somebody in Sao Paulo because somebody told me that only in Sao Paulo they do it. So I asked Rogerio. Rogerio said, "Okay, we invite you, but you have to give lecture uh, quantum gravity." Uh, <laughs> achievements and perspectives. And I was upset because how I will do it in one hour, quantum gravity. <laughs> so finally I did the seminar. And then it was very nice because we started here some collaboration with Sasha Belev. And uh, we are good friends with Rogerio and we did something together <laughs> after that. So uh, uh, I always wanted to uh, continue and give some uh, lecture course because I gave lecture courses like that in some places and would be very nice to have it here. So actually, I'm grateful to Jessica and Eduardo for organizing this. Now, it's second time I will do it with uh, chalk because usually I do it with transparencies. It's much faster. But we will do it with chalk, which is also nice. Uh, now, so let me start. Uh, for, uh, first of all, as Eduardo said, any questions are welcome, okay? If I don't like to answer immediately, I will say, don't worry. So it's really, really better you ask me because otherwise I will finish in 15 minutes everything. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a natural uh, tendency is to accelerate. <laughs> so so uh, first of all, what means quantum gravity? Uh, there are many answers to this question, and the answer number one is we don't know what is quantum gravity because there are no experiments of, on quantum gravity. So we basically uh, think about quantum gravity as something which is poorly theoretical for a while. Uh, second, uh, regardless it's poorly theoretical, there are a lot of different approaches to quantum gravity and absolutely impossible to cover it in five lectures. So what I will tell you is something related to renormalization 
in curved spacetime in semi-classical gravity, and then uh, randomization in quantum gravity. So it will be poorly perturbative and uh, traditional, let's say, quantum gravity and semi-classical quantum gravity. There are also many things which are very important and interesting, but I will not cover it because I'm not familiar with them or because we have no time. For example, creation of particles or from vacuum, which is interesting subject, but I will not discuss it, or Casimir effect, which is also very interesting and I also will not discuss. So uh, let us start. First of all, as I said, there are no quantum gravity experiments, so we are uh, working on quantum gravity basically because uh, we have good, very good theory of classical gravity and it has certain pro theoretical problems. Uh, the theory of, quantum gra of classical gravity, as you know, is called general, general relativity. And general relativity is a very successful theory. It passed many tests in the past and uh, every year adds something. And uh, we are actually confident that it's a nice theory. It's very, co it's correct theory. However, uh, if we go to uh, the most interesting, most simple solutions of general relativity, then we have, uh, first of all, I will write the action, the uh, Einstein, Einstein equations here. So it's like R menu minus one half G menu R equal to eight PG T menu uh, plus lambda G menu, where lambda is a cosmological constant, G is Newton constant, and T menu is uh, energy momentum tensor of matter and radiation of everything which fills the universe. So uh, in principle, uh, in general relativity, when we uh, obtain these equations, we can do it in two different ways. Or we start from general covariance uh, and uh, uh, require that there are only second derivatives. And then this is the simplest equation you can have, Lo locality, of course, of the action. And another is that you postulate the action, and the corresponding action is uh, Einstein-Hilbert. Action with cosmological constant. And once again, when we postulate the Einstein-Hilbert uh, Einstein action, we uh, start from a few requirements. One of these requirements is locality, we want that it's a local functional. Second is covariance, we want it to be covariant. And third, we don't like to have higher derivatives. So we forbid the existence of derivatives uh, more than the second order. Uh, in principle, all these three requirements uh, should be somehow motivated. For example, locality is something we are accustomed in quantum field theory. We know that all uh, other interactions are very well described by uh, classical local actions, and then all localities come uh, in quantum corrections. Here we will see that this is more or less the same. So if you start from local action, we will have no local quantum corrections. I will describe uh, at least uh, three different ways we can see non-localities in the action. Uh, and the last requirement is not to have uh, derivatives more than two derivatives. This is complicated because we will see that in semi-classical theory, we are forced to include more derivatives. So we are somehow forced to go beyond the Einstein gravity, even in classical theory, if we want to have consistent theory in curved spacetime. Uh, yeah. And so what is the motivation to make quantum uh, considerations? First of all, if we have the uh, Schwarzschild solution, so it is one minus R uh, G over R D T square minus D R square over y minus R G over R and minus R square D omega. This is the solid uh, angle. And R G is two G M. This is in the units, everything is in the units when uh, C e equals to one, uh, speed of light equal to one. So we see that this uh, metric has two uh, singularities. 
One is when uh, R equal to RG, this is horizon. Uh, one can prove that at the horizon, uh, there is no physical singularity in the following sense. The combinations of uh, curvature tensors, for example, R menu alpha beta square, uh, does not have singularity at this point. So uh, in principle, point-like particle can go through the horizon uh, to inside the black hole, and nothing happened to it. Uh, and uh, in this sense, it's not a bad feature of the theory to have this singularity in the metric. You can change coordinates. This is in the coordinates R and T, and angles are coordinates, uh, which becomes uh, become uh, Minkowski uh, coordinates in the uh, infinity, in the space infinity. So uh, if you change coordinates, there are Kruskal coordinates, Finkelstein coordinates, then uh, the metric lose this singularity. However, there is another singularity, one over R, and this is not a good thing because in this place, uh, this uh, Kretschmann invariant becomes infinite, and it is a real singularity. So in this point, you have a point like mass and infinite density of mass and so on. You may think that this is not a tragedy because even in Newtonian theory, if you look to Newtonian potential, then you have minus g m over r, and you have exactly the same singularity, zero point. But here it is a little bit worse because there is a situation when the star, for instance, big star, is collapsing, and uh, when it collapses such that you have the horizon, then it can, it, uh, the analysis of people who work on that shows that this collapse may continue, and finally it really forms a point like uh, mass and with infinite density. So this is something we don't like too much. This is something we don't like too much, and um, uh, in principle, it can be somehow resolved. For example, in a Newton gravity, we know that this is resolved because real masses are not point-like, like sun is not point-like, it's big, <laughs> okay? And uh, planets are big, so there is no this situation. And here you can have situation when, uh, according to theoretical analysis, you really form a point-like uh, point -like singularity. Another uh, situation when you can have, uh, please. And just, just, uh, just wondering, so about this distinction you're making in the two cases. Mm -hmm. So behind this is, is, is the, uh, so you have some matter, and when you do a Newton analysis, you're sort of assuming uh, by default that the other interaction can hold the matter from collapsing, right? Uh, yeah. So, which is similar here. So what, what is, uh, so we know that, that eventually uh, nothing will be able, uh, at some point, uh, nothing will prevent the collapse. But is there really an essential difference between the Newtonian analysis and, and, and the Fujiar analysis uh, from this perspective? I, I'm not a real expert on this. So as far as I understand, the, uh, this when you derive this Chandrasekhar limit or Volkov-Oppenheimer limit, maybe Rosario knows much more, more than me about this. So uh, I think you compare the uh, basically, you compare the force which um, neutrons and protons, uh, uh, hadronic matter, can create maximal, there is some maximum of this force on the surface of the collapsing star, and the gravitational force. And gravitational force you basically calculate on Newtonian level, okay? When I saw this, it was like that. So uh, this part is not relativistic. I, I think it, it is relativistic in some sense, but it's not using exactly this uh, action. The limit is that at some moment you form the horizon or not. In this place, of course, this metric has no horizon. Okay? I, th I think I'm not, a, I'm not the right person to answer this. But I, I think there is no big difference at this point. The difference is inside the black hole. The collapse continues. Okay? And black holes, as one of my, now he's postdoc, he's no, no student anymore, but he said very good thing, uh, black holes are complicated. So <laughs> he has some <laughs> serious papers about black holes, I may not. <laughs> and so black holes are complicated. For example, when you go inside the horizon, then you can see that this becomes time, and this is R, okay, because this is flip of signature. And, but still people explore this question, and uh, they show that the collapse in general relativity becomes, of course, close to singularity. This theory, uh, very, very close to singularity, may be similar, but the process may be different. 
as far as I understood. It's not my area, okay? So, uh, the next example, when you have singularities, is cosmology. Because in cosmology, we have uh, solutions. Maybe I will not even write the equations. So, the uh, metric in cosmology is like ds square equal dt square minus a square of t uh, dl square, where dl square may be k equals zero, the flat uh, space metric, or uh, k equal one minus one metric. And then if we, uh, this uh, importance of space curvature becomes very small when you go to the small universe, uh, to the uh, early universe. And uh, what happens is that if we take uh, the solution with cosmological constant and matter, because today matter is dominating, there is dark matter, there is baryonic matter and cosmological constant, you find that uh, according to these equations, uh, the universe is expanding. When the universe is expanding, then uh, for the matter, contents. Okay, you have A of T behaves like T to third. Okay, and this means that uh, rho matter, which is proportional to A minus four, A I minus three, and rho radiation, which is proportional A minus four, and rho cosmological constant, which is proportional a zero. So we see that if you, when the universe was much smaller than today, then radiation should dominate, because today is like 10 minus four, and these uh, two guys are of order one, but when the universe was like one million times smaller than now, this was dominating, and then radiation epoch, radiation epoch, is like A of T behaving like T one half, and then Hubble parameter, which is A point over A, behaves like one over T. This is amazing because uh, according to this theory, uh, to generativity, uh, this is the initial stage of the universe because after you started, you enter going uh, backward in time, when you enter the radiation dominated epoch, you cannot expect big changes before that. So uh, go to, you really go to zero time, and then you have H proportional to one over T, then curvature becomes infinite, uh, density of energy uh, becomes infinite, and we uh, end up with singularity. Once again, we think that singularity is something inappropriate for physical theory, and we want to see how to avoid singularity. Now, uh, one of the possibilities is that uh, this action was obtained uh, on the equations, uh, or Einstein equations, were obtained when uh, we had experiments and data observations uh, for moderate energies, relatively moderate energies. And when you arrive close to singularity of this or this type, then you may think that the uh, rules of the game were supposed to change, the action changed, the equations of motion change and singularity in the new theory should disappear, should disappear. The next question is, why we think that this is somehow related to quantum effects? And here we rely on dimensional analysis. Actually, it's not for sure. Maybe there is nothing like that. But uh, if we rely to dimensional analysis, then we have the following situation. That uh, if you go to Gaussian system of units, there are three uh, dimensional, fundamental dimensional quantities. Speed of light which is, we know, very big, uh, h-bar, which is very small in normal situation, and g, this uh, Newton constant. They are dimensional, and you can uh, use them in the unique way. This is, we have a book on mechanics, there is an exercise to make it, okay? And, and derive uh, in a unique way the units of uh, lens, Okay, I remember that it is like 10 minus 43 centimeters. And time, okay, it's 10 minus 33 seconds. And mass, mass is like uh, 10 minus five grams. Okay, if we use units when H bar and C are equal to one, then this guy is something like uh, 10, 19 GV. It's a very, very big energy. 1019 CV is a very big energy. 
just to have an idea, the maximal energy we have in accelerators, in, like uh, LHC or uh, others, is something like 10 in order 4 GV. So the difference is 15 orders of magnitude. The maximal energy we can observe somehow in laboratories is this Auger project with ultra high energy cosmic rays, which gives you 10, 11 GV. So the difference is four, eight orders of magnitude. Eight orders of magnitude is 100 million times. So it's a big difference. So this is a huge energy. So what this dimensional analysis tells us? Basically, it tells us that when we are at the energies of this uh, order of magnitude, okay, then we can expect simultaneously that there will be some relativistic quantum and gravitational physics. So what it means, what means uh, relativistic uh, quantum and gravitational physics at the same time? Dimensional analysis does not tell this to us, so we don't know. But uh, in principle, as I told you at the beginning, there are many approaches to quantum gravity, because you can say this is quantum gravity. Quantum gravity, relativistic by definition, everything is supposed to be relativistic. So what, what it means, the quantum gravity in the wide sense, let's say, and here, uh, as I said uh, many times already, okay, there are many, many approaches. And these many approaches, uh, you can be lost at some moment because there is something uh, uh, like loop quantum gravity or there is traditional perturbative quantum gravity. There is string theory, different versions actually of string theory. There is supergravity, there is uh, uh, maybe something else, maybe something which I missed, okay? And so when I wrote this first uh, uh, lecture which Rogerio ordered me, so I made the classification. Uh, and the classification is the following. We can sp divide all approaches to quantum gravity into three big groups. First, we can quantize, quantize metric, metric plus matter fields. matter fields. From quantum mechanical point of view, this is the best option. There were papers in the 60s by David and other people. They proved that any other approach is somehow inconsistent. But uh, inconsistent theoretically, maybe not by the end of the day, uh, means that they are ruled uh, completely. So there is a second possibility. We have quantum theory, quantum theory, of matter fields, of matter fields, matter fields on curved classical background, classical background. This is what people call semi-classical gravity. So matter fields are quantum and gravity is classical. This approach has, has huge advantage compared to number one, because we know that this is correct. Why we know this is correct? Because we know that matter fields are quantum. Okay, we have a lot of confirmations of this, in, from accelerators to atomic physics to everything, okay? We know that photons are quantum from uh, 115 years, <laughs> okay? And we know many things about quantum matter. Also, we know we have a lot of a lot of experimental confirmation that curved spacetime is uh, something real. So the spacetime is quantum. So we have to ask in the first place, what is the back reaction of matter fields on the background? So because fact that you do not quantize metric does not mean that quantization of matter fields does not affect the action of gravity. So it's perfectly possible that when you quantize matter fields, you have to add something to this section or replace this section by something else. And then you maybe solve singularity problem, or maybe you solve other problems, and maybe you can even observe this difference in some experiments. So this is pro certainly the most uh, fundamental approach, but this is certainly the most safe approach, okay? And then you have approach number three, I will say the following, quantize something 
else? Something else, what something else? So you can have many, diff many different possibilities. For instance, um, in uh, 1967, Zeldovich suggested that gravity cannot be quantized because there is no, no action for gravity. Gravity is induced. So you start with a theory of matter fields without fixing gravitational action. There is no gravitational action. And then quantum loops or uh, even classical effects of gravity create you, uh, for you at low energies some action. For example, these terms can be perfectly well calculated. And then you have this is approach of induced gravity. Then it had many developments, in, in particular string theory, with, it is a huge, uh, let's say, palace of knowledge called string theory, which is very complicated, very interesting, has a lot of uh, developments, but it completely belongs to this group, because you quantize string uh, or superstring, and you believe that this gives you uh, quantum, uh, uh, some gravity as a low energy approximation, and, and you, it gives you uh, some other things as a low energy approximation. Uh, I think uh, we will discuss this induced gravity in the last lecture, and I probably convince you, I hope I convince you, that conceptually this does not give any uh, preference. It does not ben benefit us from conceptual point of view. So it's possible technically to make this in many ways, but it does not fundamental problems which you have in two first approaches, in my opinion. Okay. So uh, let us start some questions about this initial, uh, let's say, qualitative <laughs> uh, bootstrap. <laughs> okay. No questions. Okay. Let's go. So uh, let's start with semi-classical gravity. So first three lectures will be completely about number two. Then the fourth lecture will be about quanti quantum metric. And the last lecture will be about induced gravity and effective approach to gravity also. The reason is that technically, technically, he, here we have like 90% of what we need here. So if you understand how it works, uh, then it, you will easily understand papers on quantum gravity. Let me say that in five lectures, it's difficult to learn things. In the four, I give one semester course of quantum gravity in curved space and a little bit quantum gravity. So technically, I cannot uh, make big calculations here, okay, so certainly. But uh, you have these transparencies. Transparencies are also there give, made for such lectures, light, okay? But in principle, if you wish, I can give you some material also. Also, I met once one uh, young guy in Germany who uh, read like 20 of my papers, and I spoke to him like with my student, so he really understood everything. <laughs> so <laughs> it is possible, it is possible. And he's from particle physics, <laughs> actually, not from uh, quantum, formal quantum field theory. Okay? So the first question is, if we want to quantize matter fields, so we have to construct matter fields, right, in a curved space, in curved space. And in order to quant quant construct the actions of, uh, of matter fields in curved space, it is good to have some principles, okay? So let us establish first the principles. And the first principle is covariance. Covariance. Okay, so we want that our classical action is covariant. Second is, of course, locality. Locality. So we want that classical action of fields are local. And the third is, I would say, simplicity. Simplicity. We want that our action of matter fields would be as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. Or, in other words, we want to have consistent quantum theory. And we will see uh, by the end of this lecture that simplicity implies that we have no uh, inverse mass dimension, inverse mass parameters. Inverse mass parameters. Okay? So, in principle, you can introduce these parameters, but they are not really necessary. We will see this. So, this is uh, these three principles. 
enable us to construct fields of the spin zero, one half, and one. But, but you can instead use, and this is the so-called non-minimal scheme. Non-minimal scheme. Okay, for constructing classical fields. But there is even simpler scheme, which is a minimal scheme. Minimal. Minimal scheme. Okay, and minimal scheme is the following: you just make take classical classical action of some field, free field, in flat space, and make it covariant by the following prescription. First of all, you sorry. You trade flat metric, okay? This, whoop. ah, here is normal chalk. So you have at the menu, you trade it to G menu, okay? Then uh, simple derivative, partial derivative, you trade it to covariant derivative. And finally, the integral, four-dimensional integral, you trade for, uh, four-dimensional integral with covariant element of volume. And this guarantees that you have your local and covariant action and simplicity, of course, because it cannot be simpler than that, okay? So is there a difference between these two schemes? Yes, there is. Let me show you, and we start from normal scalar field. So if I take a usual scalar field, a real scalar field, then we have the following action and follow minimal prescription. Then we have the following action. Okay? This is. Yeah, good question. So, and uh, yeah, here we stop. Let's say, put it here, minimal. As Rogerio correctly said, it should be covariant derivative, but, but remember that the for, for scalar field, uh, partial derivative is already covariant, okay? By the way, this year will uh, uh, be published in Springer, uh, my book about tensor calculus and with notes of general relativity. So these things are very well explained there, I believe, okay? Maybe uh, in more details than uh, for, this is for, uh, based on lectures in Juiz de Forest, they are very basic, okay? So I, I believe that everybody should know that, okay? Because otherwise these lectures are not going to be very useful perhaps, okay? So this is the minimal prescription. You have this free action, okay? Uh, just to have it all uh, uh, more, let's say, uh, uh, complete, let's put here lambda over five, four, okay, five, four, and this will be even interaction, self-interaction, no problem. Now, if I won't do it with a non-minimal scheme, what changes? These terms are certainly here, okay, because this is covariant. By the way, these are partial derivatives, but in couples to metric through this metric and this square root minus g. G is determinant of the metric, okay? So this is local, this is uh, a covariant, but if we follow these principles, it's easy to see that we can add one more term. We can have non-minimal term, okay, which is of the following form, one half xi r phi squared, where i is a scalar curvature. This term is not forbidden by our three principles because the dimension of xi is zero the dimension of xi is zero. So you can, you have right to put this term. Uh, you can think, okay, why I cannot put more terms? The reason is that any extra term you can add will come with the inverse mass parameter. For example, if you want r mu nu, d mu phi, d nu phi. Okay, then you have here one over, let's say, uh, zeta, and this zeta is mass square, mass squared because d phi, d phi already have dimension four, r menu has dimension two, so overall it is six. d, d for x uh, gives you only one over m four, so xi is m score. So this, our three principles forbid this structure, and any other. 
any other. So, uh, so this is basically all you can put to the scalar sector. Is it true? No. You can put more terms. You can put more terms. Why? Because our three principles do not forbid that we include terms which do not depend on scalar field. Okay? So let us put here terms which depend only on metric, only on metric, but they are not forbidden. So everything which is not forbidden is permitted. So we can have here this uh, action of Einstein-Hilbert, okay, which I already had before, plus, okay, here you can see that this is one over mass square, so this is mass square, and lambda is mass four, okay? You have uh, rho lambda, it's very useful notation, is lambda over eight pi g. So this is four, fourth power of mass, and this is second power of mass. Okay, no inverse mass parameters, of course. Plus, plus, let's put it as higher derivatives. Okay, and as higher derivatives, according to our three principles, consists from the following uh, four structures. A1, mu alpha beta square, plus A2, r mu square, plus A3, r square, plus a4 box R. You really cannot put more terms. Okay? Well, you can you can put something which violates parity. Okay? If you want. But I, this I did not put here. So you perhaps maybe we really better I correct myself and put here symmetries. Preserve symmetries. Preserve symmetries. This is a disadvantage working with chalk because it is on the transparencies. <laughs> I forgot. It. So, so for example, we won't keep parity. Then we do not put here Hall's term or uh, Pandragon structure and so on. So, but but uh, also we will keep gauge invariance when it's very important uh, classical symmetry in flat space time, and we will keep it in curved space. Actually, actually, instead of this basis. It is better to use another basis. So let me introduce at once this thing. This is C square, okay? I will write it in a complete way once, okay? This is Riemann square, okay, R, menu alpha beta square. Square means this combination, of course. Minus two R menu square plus one over three R square. And uh, E is R menu alpha beta square uh, minus four R menu square plus R square. This is called gauss bonnet invariant. Many people call it G. I hate it because then at one some moment you start to make <laughs> confusion with this G. So I use E because this, from the point of view of topology, this is called Euler characteristics. Okay, Euler characteristics. So we call it E or sometimes E4. Okay. And so uh, if we go to this basis, it's very good exercise for the student. Use these two formulas and find square of the Riemann tensor and square of the Ricci tensor as linear combination of C square, E, and R square. This takes a couple of minutes. And it's very good exercise, OK? Very useful exercise. So in this basis, we can write all these structures in a different way, perhaps I I like this A, so I will put here tildes, and there will be D4X, square root of minus G, uh, A1 C square, plus A2 Gauss Bonnet, plus A3 uh, R square, plus A4 box R. Okay, so your exercise is to find how A1, A2, a and A3 depend on A1, A2, and N3 with tildes uh, in both ways. It's a few minutes exercise. If you can do it, just come to me. I will do it for you. Okay, not a good idea to make it here because we have not very much time. Okay, but in principle, I can do even now. Good questions? So, 
once again, we have actually some serious results here. We have minimal part of the action. I will use this wording all the time. This is non-minimal part of the action, and this is vacuum part of the action, vacuum part of the action. Okay, we have, we formulate a scalar field in curved space, and we have all this. Uh, before I, uh, there is a very interesting observation about this action, okay? I prefer to go first to uh, spinner fields and vector fields, and then come back to, to this color, okay? So for fermions, how it works for fermions? So for fermions, we have uh, immediately uh, a certain trouble. Why? Because let us remember how the Dirac action looks in curved space. So you have S, uh, what I was calling it minimum, okay, then fermion, okay. Fermion will be I D for X square root minus G, and then, uh, no, no minus G, for, for a while flat, okay. Psi, and then you have gamma alpha, nabla alpha, uh, minus plus E M psi, okay? The question is how we go to curved space. First of all, how we go to curved space with the gamma matrix, because metric has two indexes, and gamma matrix has one index. How you can make it covariant, whether it's possible or not? And it is possible. For this, you need to introduce the, another object, which is called tetrada. Tetrada, or people use German weight, firbein, firbein, which means four legs. Okay, four legs, of course, it has four legs only in four-dimensional space, but you can do it in many-dimensional space. But I'm not familiar with German, so I don't know how to translate it to N legs. <laughs> okay, so we will use tetrada. So this is called tetrada. And tetrada is uh, the coefficients of transition between locally Minkowski frame with the index A. So, uh, and maybe I better do it here. I will put here A, and here I put this. Ah, much better, much better. So this A is a uh, space-time index, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it corresponds to the locally Minkowski frame, reference frame. And mu corresponds to arbitrary frame. So we know that uh, you, can, you can even say that this is D, she's A over D, X, mu, where she's A is locally Minkowski coordinate, locally Minkowski coordinate. So then we can say that G menu is at a, a B, uh, E, A, mu, E, B, nu, or in other words, it is E, mu, A, E, a new because indexes A and B you can rise and lower with the flat metric, flat space metric. So no, no chalk, only <laughs> only uh, only these big pieces. Let me tell you the story. <laughs> No, this I cannot use. Really? This yellow one, I could use it if it's like. You only want the small one? Yeah. Yeah, the small one. Yeah. No, I can use big one. Don't, don't worry, Eduardo, forget I it. I think it's small. Okay, thank you. So, so this tetrada satisfies this uh, formula, and also it satisfies, like, you can, you can make inverse transformation. Of course, I leave it as small exercise for uh, students. So this is eta AB, and you can have similar thing with upper indexes A mu, A, B mu equal eta A B and E mu A E nu A equal to G minu. So tetrada is, a, people sometimes say, it's square root of the metric, okay? With these formulas, we can easily construct gamma matrix with covariant index. So gamma alpha is E alpha A uh, gamma A. This new gamma matrix, it, uh, satisfies the Clifford algebra. Can I erase this? Okay. So it satisfies Clifford algebra in curved space. Okay. By the way, uh, Clifford uh, frequently visits our department in Juiz de Fora. And uh, so this is, uh, you can uh, prove that gamma alpha, gamma beta plus gamma beta 
gamma alpha equals to 2 g alpha beta, okay, with this definition. Good exercise for students if, if you want to do it, it would be nice. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is a new Clifford algebra for this new type of gamma matrices in curved space. A little bit more difficult to is to construct covariant derivative. So for this end, we're supposed to do the following. We write uh, this, okay, uh, covariant derivative of the uh, spinner, direct spinner, and we, by definition, we require that this is partial derivative of spinner plus I over 2 omega alpha AB sigma AB psi. Okay? Where sigma AB, as usual, is I over 2 gamma A gamma B minus gamma B gamma A. Okay? Then we uh, go to conjugate a spinner, and we have uh, for this you have d alpha psi bar minus i over two omega alpha a b sigma ah uh, no c bar sigma a b. Okay, this is just from uh, uh, complex conjugation and. Uh, transposition and so on, multi multiplying by gamma zero and so on, okay? After we do this, we can try to find omegas because omegas are unknown coefficients. And uh, by the way, I have paper recently published in the journal uh, Men's Agitat of Estado de Roraima, okay? I'm very proud of it, as you can imagine, because I, I bet nobody else except me have a paper here. Rogerio, for example, even didn't know about the existence of this nice journal, Roraima State. <laughs> okay? And in this journal, there is my paper. And in this paper, you can find all details of this and many other things concerning fermions. Uh, uh, okay? So you can just, you don't need this lecture. You can just take this paper from uh, Men's Agitat and learn what you want. It's also in archive if you don't like to make a serious search in the state of Roraima, go to, <laughs> to visit some, okay, <laughs> things. So, so you just uh, go to archive and you find this paper. Good. So uh, it's very good exercise for the students is to do the following. Check that uh, the uh, covariant derivative applied to scalar gives you automatically, without, for any omega, gives you this. Okay? It's very simple exercise, I would say, even primitive. But, but, we can require something else. We can require that acting on vector combination, you have T alpha psi gamma mu psi uh, minus uh, plus gamma mu beta alpha uh, psi gamma beta psi, okay? So if you require this, this uh, equation together with natural condition that nabla mu e alpha uh, a equal to zero, no problem. Sorry. <laughs> you see, <laughs> so, so together with this, uh, you have, uh, you can find easily the solution for omega, okay? And I know there is some yellow. Actually, there are some remnants here, so I can use remnants. Yeah, yeah. The formula, I don't, I, I wrote this paper, you know, in Men's Agitat, and after that I forgot the, the result, so I have to consult my uh, notes. Yeah. So I have to, if I, if I can recognize what is written. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Omega uh, alpha AB equals to uh, one half E uh, B. Uh, no, I have to. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, thank you. Oh, big one. Yeah, it is. Good, good, good. Makes you feel more powerful. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I'm completely lost. I have to put my glasses because I use glasses. I can see. Ah, okay. So this is alpha B D. No, this is not alpha. Oh my God, this is beta alpha alpha here E A uh, beta, yeah, plus gamma alpha. Uh, no, alpha here lambda uh, A E B. Uh, no, it is beta. Uh -huh. Beta, I change it indexes, never good. So lambda and A, yeah. And you can even prove that this expression gives you negative omega alpha BA. So it's anti symmetric by construction. Okay? Um, this is a good exercise. This is a very good exercise for students to derive this from this. And not, not difficult, I would say, okay? Difficult part is to uh, find the consistency of this uh, equation if you go to this uh, men's agitat publication. So you will see that this is relatively com complicated and this is relatively simple, <laughs> okay? Oh yeah, of course. When you when you when you are in this is called uh, by the or by the way omega is called spinner connection, or some people call it Fock Ivaninka coefficients. Okay, you can find in the literature Fock Ivaninka coefficients, but uh, most of the people call it spinner connection because it is completely analogous to gamma, but in the spinner space. Okay, if you go to more general space time like uh, with torsion or with non metricity then there will be extra term here, extra terms, okay? I, I'm not sure about that non-metricity was elaborated, actually. Probably it was in a few last years, but I'm not sure. Real for joke. You. Just for you. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, Jerry, I knew that you are a powerful man here, so. Yes. <laughs> uh. Okay. So we have fermion, uh, fermion action, okay? And we, we, need, we have everything we need to construct uh, covariant action of uh, fermions. So we have gamma mu, uh, covariant derivative of mu plus this. It's not explicitly real, but you can square put... Square root of minus g. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Square root of minus, extremely important. Square root of minus g psi bar, yeah. So this is a covariant action for fermions, okay? And uh, the ne next question is, can we introduce here some uh, non-minimal structure? The answer is negative, why? For dimensional reason, because you see, there is only one derivative, it means that mass dimension of the field psi is three over two. So non-minimal term which you can put uh, is supposed to be constructed from curvature as it was in the scalar case. And curvature R has uh, dimension mass square. So without inverse mass dimensions, which are forbidden by our principles, we cannot put here non-minimal structure. Non-minimal structure is not possible in four dimensions. In four dimensions. Okay? So uh, at the same time, there is absolutely no problem to introduce interaction. For example, u cover interaction will be uh, like d4x square root minus g then you have phi, psi bar, psi, and there is no problem at all, okay? You can also uh, trade uh, normal covariant derivative to extended covariant derivative, which is covariant derivative minus E A mu with uh, abelian or non-abelian vector field, no problem. The same with scalars, of course, for this end you need complex scalar, okay? Complex scalar is also easy to to make, okay? Is it easy to construct uh, non-minimal action with complex scalar? Actually, if you have many scalar fields coming back to scalar field, if you have many scalar fields phi i, then the general form of the non-minimal term will be xi i j, phi i phi j r, okay? This is 
uh, generic uh, form of the uh, I feel Rosario and Eduardo uh, after a half an hour we will have all uh, <laughs> jokes <laughs> from the neighborhood <laughs> so, <laughs> which is good because you when I leave you have some jokes too. <laughs> no, so, so, so you, we have uh, non-minimal non-minimal structures of general form uh, um, okay in this uh, form in this form good so the next point is how to construct the vector fields and for vector fields actually there is no big surprises let's put it a gauge vector okay and I will start with uh, abelian case so it's integral d for x square root minus g g menu g alpha beta f mu alpha f new beta okay let's write it this way because it's good to keep here matrix just to show uh, how we uh, use metric to construct covariant objects uh, an interesting observation is that f mu alpha is nabla alpha uh, nabla mu a nu minus nabla nu a mu but but if we open these covariant derivatives then we will have d mu a nu minus d nu a mu uh, and then you have here minus gamma uh, nu mu lambda a lambda and here we have the same term with plus uh, mu nu a lambda since we have no torsion these two guys cancel okay and we see that f mu, uh, f mu alpha does not depend on metric but of course metric enters through these two and uh, Matrix here with upper indexes and with square root of minus g. Uh, if we want to do it with non-abelian, with non-abelian, there will be uh, basically the same thing, but then you have here instead of g, you will have this guy and this guy, okay? And as usual, the definition of g will have this uh, this part plus structure constants with two a. I will not write. I hope everybody knows that. Okay, so there is no difference at this level, at this level. Now let me say that we did some big work, actually, big job here, because we have scalar action with self-interaction. We have fermion action with interaction, Yukawa and gauge interaction. And we constructed vector fields in curved space. So all in all, we constructed all elements which are needed to formulate, let's say, standard model or grand unification theories in curved space, in curved space. So we can just now start to do something more uh, exciting, let's say. Okay? Let us do something more exciting, just here without any quantum considerations. Let us come back to scalar field and consider how it looks the spontaneous symmetry breaking in curved space time. Okay? This is a question which comes first because we know that in flat space, in flat space, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking is something very important because uh, it provides is a mechanism uh, to provide mass to gauge bosons, okay, and to define the vacuum state of your theory. Here, of course, the question of vacuum state, as I said before, I will not discuss creation of particles, and in fact, I will not discuss even construction of vacuum, because in curved space, constructing vacuum is impossible. In the, in, for general space-time metric, you cannot construct a unique vacuum state for quantization. And this is a serious moment because it's not a technical difficulty. It's some fundamental uh, feature which was discovered by uh, people in the 70s, by Fulling, actually. It was in 73 or 74. So let us start. But we, can, we will not go to this complicated part. Let us just see how we can uh, deal with the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in uh, curved space uh, without constructing vacuum. But because this is also the way to see uh, the vacuum. So let me write the action of complex scalar, okay, uh, with uh, non-minimal term. I will not use this formula. I prefer to write another one. Okay, and here we have g mu uh, d mu phi 
star d nu phi star uh, plus one half psi phi star phi. I, I will not write a vector and fermion fields which can be coupled to this color, only scalar uh, part uh, for brevity. So this is mi uh, minus, no, plus, this time plus m phi star phi and uh, uh, minus uh, lambda over uh, two, let's say, phi star phi square, okay? Uh, why I did not use this formula? Because I changed the sign of the mass. So instead of m, I will put here mu zero square, okay? Because uh, it is wrong sign of mass as usual for the spontaneous symmetry uh, breaking. Uh, well, this we can keep for a while. So uh, what we can do, we can uh, try to find the equation for the vacuum expectation value. And this vacuum expectation value is uh, simply the scalar field. Let's take variation with respect to phi star, and we have the following equation, minus box V plus xi r, uh, xi r, xi r V, okay, plus uh, mi zero square V and minus uh, lambda uh, V cube equal to zero, right? Uh, yeah. This is the equation for the vacuum expectation value. This is a very, very easy to solve equation when we are in flat space time. Why? Because we say that V is constant, then this term goes away, and you just have basically linear equation to solve. It gives you this uh, Mexican head picture and so on. Here, it is not at all simple. Why? Because R is not a mass. R is an arbitrary function of space time. It can be variable. So if we solve it and forget this term and solve it, then we are going to miss this effect of curvature. If we uh, put this term together with this and treat it as variable mass, then V, vacuum expectation value, well, will be uh, variable. And then again, we, you cannot ignore box V. So what we will do? We will try to make an assumption. An assumption will be that Xi R is a very small thing, okay? So let us believe that Xi R is much smaller than mu zero square. Mu zero square much smaller than mu zero square. And then we do the following. First, we solve it for uh, zero psi. Then we start to make iterations. I will not go very far with these iterations, but uh, only to the first order. So for mu zero, we have lambda v zero uh, cube, uh, lambda, lambda v zero cube uh, equals to mu zero square v zero, and of course, this means that V0 uh, square is uh, mu0 square over lambda, right? This is something very simple. Now, oh. What, what if you, we are in this deceitful space -based? Of course, if you are on the center space, things become simple. You can assume that V is constant, and this is just an addition to mass, no problem. But our purpose is to construct the theory which is not restricted to the sitter or anti the sitter. Our purpose is to construct the theory which is valid for any curvature, okay, uh, for any metric. Basically, the uh, whole approach which I will follow will be the following. We want to find some action for gravity and then to obtain uh, a solution for this action, solution for the metric. If I define beforehand that my metric is the sitter or Schwarzschild or something else or flat, there is no point to continue. You can just stop on that. Of course, this uh, does not mean that all papers on the sitter have no sense. So there are very, very interesting papers on the sitter, including uh, sophisticated. So you can sometimes, uh, when you have very small material, extract a lot, okay? I, I can, maybe not in this course, but in principle, there are examples. But uh, in principle, the our wish is to make it for arbitrary metric. 
Okay, so we cannot see that curvature is a constant. Good, please. Yeah, yeah, this is for weak, weak, weak gravity, yeah, exactly. For example, if you take Higgs inflation, there is a model of inflation which is based essentially on this term, okay? It appeared 11 years ago. So in Higgs inflation, Xi is of the order 40,000. Then in the epoch of inflation, in the epoch of inflation, this, uh, this approximation does not work at all, okay? It, it simply is out of question. So, but uh, in other, in other uh, regions, you can do it. Okay. So uh, I'm. Uh, so if you go to the action frame. Uh huh. You can decouple the R from the phi. Sure. And then if you solve that without the doubt, you would be that a certain frame. So, I mean, you could solve everything in the nonlinear regime without bringing in a C. Of course, you can. Yeah, you can. So why, why do you choose to proceed that way? Uh, no, no, no. You, you can. Uh, w w when you go to Einstein frame, uh, is a f it means the following. It means that you make um, conformal transformation of the metric, which depends on the field, yeah. and uh, some reparameterization of scalar field, which is in this case not very complicated. Okay. When you do this, it's fine. But uh, in principle, uh, what I want to do is something different. I want to see how this, uh, uh, this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking changes in this original variable. Right. Okay, this is what I want to do at the moment. Okay. Uh, 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 because my question is, you should get the same frame, right? No. No? No, of course not. Because, for instance, the, uh, imagine that you go to another frame and you have this uh, V0 constant. Uh, which is frozen, yes? Right. Then you go to uh, uh, Jordan frame, to with this, for instance. Okay, let's call it this way. And since you made a conformal transformation of the metric and reparameterization of scalar field, it might happen that your uh, uh, vacuum expectation value in the new, first of all, what is the vacuum expectation value in the new frame? I don't know, okay? Then, uh, you, actually, I don't know the answer. Probably, my feeling is that it will not be uh, equivalent because exactly as you said, in this case, we don't need this assumption. Okay? So probably it will be different. But maybe, maybe in some special regimes, they will be the same. It's an interesting question to check, actually. It's interesting. I agree. Okay? But uh, as far as I know, nobody did it. Okay? Good. So we have this in the zero order. And the, now we do the following. We say that V equals to V0 plus V1 plus etc. And V this V1 will be of the first order in uh, Xi, in Xi. So for V1, we will have the following equation. V1 plus Xi R V0 plus mi0 square v0 minus lambda, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, no, here is will be, I think it will be v1 here, and minus lambda v uh, minus 3 lambda v0 square v1, yes, and this is 0, yeah, perfect. Okay, and now we can solve it because this is a linear equation for v1. And we have uh, we have uh, box uh, plus three uh, lambda v zero square, and yeah, I can uh, use uh, this uh, here, so it will be minus lambda v zero square v one equal to uh, xi r v zero. Right? And then, we will have uh, V1 equals to uh, Xi R V0, no, maybe better, Xi V0 
divided by box plus two lambda v zero square, and this acts to the box. So this is a green function. So we have first solution. You can go on and calculate the v2, v3, and so on and so forth. Okay, I will not do it. Uh, this actually all this was done by uh, Eduard Gorber and myself, and at that moment Eduard Gorber was postdoc here in EFT. Okay, <laughs> and so you can go to our paper and find it, or I have some review paper in classical quantum gravity. There is all the same thing. So what is interesting is the following. Now we take this sum v0 plus v1 and replace it back to the classical action. And when we replace it back to the classical action, we will have the following. We have S induced. So we get at once the induced action of gravity. And this induced action of gravity will be integral d4x square root of minus g. And here we will have minus lambda over 2 v0 4. Uh, minus uh, mu zero square over two v zero square, which is the same thing, of course. Then we will have plus one half psi r uh, v zero square. Maybe I erase this part just to continue. Okay, this has nothing uh, especially interesting. And then uh, I don't think I will make full calculation. I will just write for you the result. Then there will be the term with some coefficient, which I don't remember by heart. I, I can, maybe, maybe I'll look to my notes better. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. So, uh, yeah. Plus, etc. And I will take big chalk. Amazing. Okay. So after some calculations, we get the following uh, answer. So d4x square root. No, this I, I cannot write it. <laughs> Lambda v04 minus psi r v0 square plus psi square v0 square r, 1 over box, plus 4 lambda v0 square r, plus etc. Okay? So what you can see here is the following, that this spontaneous symmetry breaking in curved space gave you induced cosmological constant with a huge coefficient, for example, if you assume that this is all about standard model, then V0 is something like 246 GV. So this is a huge term compared to what is observed because rho lambda observable is of the order 10 minus 48 GV4. And this term is something like 10.8 GV4. Okay? So there is 56 orders of magnitude difference. But this term, this term comes with a moderate coefficient because psi r, psi v0 square, of course. Psi v0 square is uh, something psi. We don't know what is psi, but this will be some, something like 10, 4 gv square. And uh, mass, Planck of the mass, um, Planck mass square is g minus 1 is uh, about 10, 38 GV square. What all this means? It means that the contribution of this term from standard model is negligible. It's like 34 uh, orders of magnitude below to what we observe. But the contribution of this is huge. It is 56 orders of magnitude greater than observed. And this is the cosmological constant problem because it means that we have to introduce classical cosmological constant with a huge coefficient which exactly cancels this guy. This is the, what, what people call a cosmological constant problem. And another moment is the following. Here we have first uh, non-locality okay, in uh, gravitational action. It comes from this uh, uh, 
bounds, or let's say modified spontaneous symmetry breaking because it's difficult to say about spontaneous symmetry breaking because in curved space there is no symmetry from the very beginning. But uh, if we use the same wording, just to keep the analogy with a flat background, then uh, of course uh, this is interesting. So we got some non-locality, non-locality and R squared. Uh, this non-locality, uh, the importance of this non-local term depends on the value of uh, V0. If we deal with the standard model, then of course I can always make the following consideration that uh, one over box plus uh, four lambda V0 square, I just write it as one over four lambda V0 square multiply by one minus box over uh, four lambda V0 square plus etc. No, no, it's just uh, my, my mistake. What? If you express this in terms of a Higgs boson mass, just to try to give it some connection to other physics. Yeah, this is, uh, if you go to the minimum, okay, V0, mm -hmm. I think this is uh, um, the mass of the excitation. Maybe I, I made a mistake no, I'm when just, I... I'm just asking whether it should be the mass of the, of the Higgs. Probably, yes. yes. Yeah, I, I, I cannot check it now. Maybe there is a summation for my question. Can you put one half here with a complex scalar that maybe creates... Maybe, 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 maybe. Okay. okay. I cannot guarantee the <laughs> correctness of the question. It should be, it makes sense that it should be the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. So, but, but, interesting the following. The one, one interesting moment is the following. If you take another scalar, let's say quintessence, okay, which uh, has minimum in the potential, then this uh, mass can be very small, maybe of order of Hubble parameter. And then this term will become very interesting to analyze. So for instance, what will be the phenomenological uh, uh, applications? Because then it, it is essentially one over box, one over box, okay? And uh, another interesting moment is that if you continue this expansion and look for the new terms, next terms in the expansion, then you will see that the term with the square of this structure uh, always cancels, okay? Some people like cosmologists based on R, R one over box square R. And I, I will comment uh, later on uh, why people like it because it, it's natural that people like it. But uh, in this mechanism, it does not appear. In this mechanism, this term does not appear. Okay? So, here we stop with, I'm making it without break. So is it correct or not? <laughs> because, no, now it is perhaps. It's the first day, let's say that. So you, you guys have to say, tell me, why don't we make a break? So. <laughs> I think it's a good idea, okay, to make break five minutes. Okay, with you to continue. No, with me I will survive, okay. <laughs> good? Okay, let's go to the, all this, what I was doing until this moment was very introductory. So now we start real business, let's say, real business. So we have scholars, fermions, uh, vectors, okay, in curved space. We have all interactions. And now we want to construct quantum theory. And if we want to construct quantum theory, the question is how we do it. And we know that in flat background, when we construct quantum field theory, there are two different approaches to this. First is canonical quantization. And second is pass integral, functional integral. And we also know that in all Interesting cases, these two approaches give you the same result in flat background. Uh, you can find some exotic examples of theories which don't give you the same result. For example, in uh, the book by Gitman Tutin, you can find an explicit example of this about quantization of gauge theories. But uh, if we don't go to these exotic examples, in flat background, it's the same thing. So when we go to curved space and we want to define quantum theory, 
we can use either canonical quantization or functional integral. And we will choose here to start with functional integral. Functional integral. Gitman Tutin. Gitman Tutin. And title I don't remember. Okay. Gitman was here in USP for many years. I think he is still there, no? So uh, okay. So let us start with functional integral and uh, immediately define the generating functional of the green functions in curved space. Let me do it explicit. So G menu. Okay, I will use the following notations. Phi, capital Phi, will be the set of scalar fields, fermion fields, vector fields, okay, of all kinds. If you have vector, you also, uh, if you need, and we need, uh, Ghost, Fadev, Popov, Ghost, there will be also included. All this will have the name matter fields. So I don't say that uh, the Ghosts are nice to call Ghosts matter fields, but we will do it, okay? Maybe it's not nice. Uh, so matter fields will be everything which is not gravity. And then the definition of uh, generating function of the green functions will be exponential of ES of phi g plus E j phi. j phi is, we call it David notations, these condensed notations which mean that for each of these fields you introduce the source. In many cases you don't need to introduce source for uh, ghosts, but it's, I will not just uh, will skip this part. It depends on your, of what you are going to do. Okay? Questions? So what is the difference with normal uh, flat space? So for example, phi, uh, phi j is integral d for x square root minus g phi i j i, where i runs along all indexes, includes group indexes if you have SU2, SU3, and so are groups. So it's uh, all this is encoded here. S is the action of the theory with all possible interactions which you like to include. Okay, and uh, all the action. Now the first observation is the following. If we already know that S, S can be written as S matter plus S vacuum. Okay, and S vacuum depends only on metric. It does not depend on phi. Of course, if you have theory with this spontaneous symmetry breaking, then extracting a vacuum action is not a completely trivial problem. Okay. But we will just uh, ignore it and think that this is possible. If it is possible, then I can immediately do the following. I can take this vacuum action out of the integral, OK? Out of the integral. Let's do it a little bit later on. And first thing we do is to introduce uh, generating functional of the connected green functions, which is g, g menu, OK? So this is the generating function of connected green functions. So if you, how you use this to generating functionals for uh, defining green functions. So your correlation function, Gn of x1, x2, etc., xn, will be delta n z over delta i j x1, etc., delta i j xn, with j equal to zero, okay? If you make the same thing with omega, then you will have here generating uh, correlation functions of connected, uh, co connected green functions, connected green functions. I hope you all know what it means, okay? We have book of 92 with Bohbinder uh, and Adinsov. You can see all these definitions and proofs there. Actually, I think this part, it's hard to find in another place. Okay, so the next thing. No, there is also the book by, old book by Gaziarovich. Uh, they also give difference between connected and green functions and not, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated, I would say. 
Okay. So this is, uh, as one of my friends from Espiritu Santo says, this is not verdadera alegría. So we need something else to uh, have a real, a real thing. But before we do this, let me. Oh my God. Uh huh. Okay. Before we uh, go to the next stage, let me do one observation. So what is the difference with the green function and the generating functionals we in flat background? The difference is that here we have G menu, and G menu enters as external parameter. So mathematically, this is a functional integral which depends on external parameter, on external parameter G. If we go to approach one and start to quantize all symmetric field, then I will also add here integral over G. So G will not be external parameter. Okay? I can now introduce effective action and do other things, but I will not do it now. I will make another consideration. The question is, okay, you write, we write these formulas formally. We say functional, integral, and so on. With arbitrary metric, G menu. But how we define, how we can define uh, the integral, a functional integral in the presence of metric, in the presence of metric? This is not a trivial question. If you go to the books which define uh, functional integral, uh, you will see that there are uh, certain difficulties. People usually define them by properties, okay? Because like uh, the definition which people use in lattice are not universal up to some extent. Okay, we do it by properties, but the properties in the presence of external metric, very difficult to describe these properties. So we have to give some constructive definition of the path integral. Constructive means that we need definition which enables us to make calculations in the first approximation, all right? So how we can make calculations in the presence of arbitrary function G menu? And the answer is the following. We have several possibilities to do it. And the first one is the following. Let's take G menu and write it as at the menu plus h menu, okay? And now we will construct uh, green functions or generating functions or whatever we want as flat space objects, but in the presence of external h menu, in the presence of external h menu. This simple step shows that we can actually work in flat space, okay? But then we have extra h menu. How it works in practice, how it works in practice. For instance, you take a propagator. You need to define Feynman rules in the first place, right? You need to define Feynman rules to make calculations with this approach. How we do it? We have box plus m square, okay, uh, x uh, acting on g x y equal to delta x minus y. Very good. So we take this uh, square root, uh, 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 take box, and expand it to h menu, two powers, okay? Then this will be, let's say, h operator. Then we write h as h0 plus h1 plus h2 plus etc. Each index means the power of the external metric, h menu. You don't need to require that h menu is small. The question is not that h menu is small. You just say next order at h menu. Then, as usual, we know that g0 will be uh, like h0 minus 1. g1 will be uh, minus g0 h1, g0, and so on. OK? Maybe I put hats here. OK? And so on and so forth, and so we have our uh, diagram. Let's make uh, some uh, diagrammatic representation. Diagrammatic representation. So you have this propagator in flat background, okay? So propagator. Then now it becomes propagator, which is uh, you have G equal to G0 plus G1 plus G2 plus etc. Okay? Now you have propagator with a single line of H, okay? Then you have 
the propagator with two lines of H, they can be of this type plus of this type. Okay? Then you have many others. Then you can, in principle, we can always make resumation. Resumation. And we will have another diagrammatic representation which is somehow better. So there will be, no, this is, I start to make small mistakes, so flat plus this with many gravitational tails, okay? Just make a resumation, take into account the amount of new vertexes, plus two new vertexes and many H tails, and so on, okay? I, if you want, as an exercise, I recommend you to calculate, uh, let's say, G1 explicitly, okay, in momentum representation. Interesting that I, I give this lecture since with the forum many years, and uh, nobody ever showed me <laughs> the solution, but it is uh, not, not difficult to do. People did it first time in 50s, I think, late 50s. <laughs> so, okay, good. So this is the propagator. And then we have vertex, like let's say uh, square root of uh, square root of minus g, uh, square root of minus g lambda over four factorial phi four. So uh, normally it is uh, this vertex, right? But now it becomes modified. So you have this plus this plus etc. And then you have vertex with many gravitational tails coming to the same point. Okay? All this is quite obvious. And now I will immediately get some very important result out of it. Okay? Just from these pictures. Let us consider some theory. Actually, it doesn't matter which theory. Okay? But we suppose that this theory is renormalizable in flat background in flat background. And now we see what changes if we, in this formalism, put it to curved background, okay? For instance, let's take this uh, simple diagram. The theory is lambda phi cube, okay, which is uh, phi cube, sorry, which is super normalizable theory. And I, uh, and we, we know that this is unique in this theory. It is good exercise if somebody doesn't know it. Check that in lambda phi cube with one real scalar field, there is only one divergent diagram, this one. Other diagrams are all fine in this theory. Okay, triangle, everything. Now we put here this expansion. What happens? So we see that there are, first of all, in zero order, you still have the same diagram, which is great. Okay, next. Next, you have this kind of diagrams. When vertexes come, to uh, all extra lines come to vertex. This diagram is so simple that we don't need to calculate it because what is it? It is the expansion of square, square root of minus g. Okay, the rest of the diagram is exactly the same as it was before. So what happens? When I sum up the contributions of these diagrams with this first one, I will certainly have exactly the same square root of minus g because it's the same diagram. And the next. The next diagram will be like that. Okay? Here we observe that something extremely interesting happened because this diagram had logarithmic divisions because there were two propagators in the loop, right? So it has D4K divided by K4, logarithmic, great. But this diagram already has six propagators. So it is, it is finite. It's a finite diagram. So all the other diagrams we can imagine are of the same type. So you have like this, 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 this. Of course it is finite, certainly. It is just these two guys together give you square root of minus g multiplied by this guy, and this guy is finite, okay? And so on. So the conclusion is, in this particular theory, at least, okay, adding new tails of H menu 
may be very difficult technically because there are infinitely many new diagrams. But there is not a single new diagram which is divergent. Okay? The only new diagrams, new, let's say, conditionally new, is this one, which is immediately calculated without any effort. Okay? So we see that this approach tells us something. And in fact, it can tell us much more. For instance, for instance, by the end of the day, what we did with this approach is a normal quantum field theory in, in flat background. We know that in quantum field theory in flat background has one very important property, which is called Weinberg theorem, okay? Which Weinberg proved, Steven Weinberg proved it in 65. And it tells us that all divergences in this theory must be local. The counterterms which you need in any loop order are local. So this formalism tells us that the divergences will be local, even if you work in curved space. Next, next. Of course, you can, and you have another question. Okay, when I do this, we break explicitly the general covariance, okay? But this is not so tragic as you can think, because I can write the word identities for general covariance and prove with some effort that at quantum level, it comes back. So my effective action, okay, still I did not define effective action, but my uh, effective action, okay, I will do it next time, okay? will be covariant. There was, uh, were proofs of this in 80s, and in 1010, we proved it uh, formally with uh, my head of department from Tom Sklavrov uh, in this paper, and uh, with using Batalin uh, Wilkowski technique. So we, we can see that uh, even in this formalism, which is explicitly non-covariant, the divergences in all loops are covariant, are covariant. This is not an easy exercise, not, not like the level of this lecture, so I will not even touch this. Good. Let us go to a more, uh, have questions? Some questions? No, good. So let's go to one more example, one more example, and we will learn something very interesting and very easy. So now we consider lambda phi 4 theory. Lambda phi 4 theory. And we uh, start with this diagram. I think, Edward, do you know how it calls? It's not tadpole, right? It is something. Is tadpole or not? Uh, it's, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can call it tadpole. So we take lambda phi 4. In flat background, we have this diagram, and we know very well that it is quadratically divergent because this is one propagator, four integrations. So it is quadratically divergent. Moreover, it is quadratically divergent, but it is somehow irrelevant, okay? Because it does not contribute to the non-local form factor in the propagator. It just gives you the poor divergence. Now, we follow our procedure and add extra lines of H menu. What happens? First of all, we have the same diagram, of course, okay? Which is zero order. But then we have, yeah, we, I can just annex here uh, many lines of H menu. It does not change things with this octopus type diagram, okay? Uh, things don't change because this is just uh, some of these lines gives you square root of minus G, of course. But if we go to the next diagram, okay, we will, we will see the following. Okay, I will make it just with one extra tail of H menu. This is amazing, what we have here. Look, first of all, this diagram is not anymore quadratically divergent. It is logarithmically divergent because there are two propagators, okay? So what happened with the dimension? The dimension, if you calculate the logarithmic divergence, then you get two derivatives acting to H menu, okay? So you have, instead of quadratic divergence here, you have uh, the divergence, which is phi square, and then you have d, d, h. And, as I told you, you can prove, which I will not do here, this, this is covariant. This is covariant. Then we have only one choice. This is nothing else but phi square r. Okay? So we can see that not just this diagram with many tails here, many tails here, and so on, but this diagram 
with two propagators of scalar in the loop gives you non-minimal term, non-minimal term. And this non-minimal term is uh, basically everything which we can uh, need because we remember that we introduced some principles of covariance, locality, and so on. And this told us, this principle gave us this uh, non-minimal term. Okay, we introduced it, we followed our principles. But now we see that if we do not introduce this term, we will have a problem because this guy gives us uh, this divergence, this divergence, okay, this divergence. So, but, but in fact, this situation shows us something uh, more general. For instance, if you have more, uh, if you take more new vertices like this, uh, no. We will see that this guy is, let's call it extraterrestrial, okay? <laughs> this extraterrestrial diagram is finite because it is one, two, three propagators. Three propagators, one integral finite. So all divergences we can see, observe in this theory, are this one, which, is, which was quadratic and not interesting for us, and then there is non-minimal divergence, and of course, as usual, we have this guy in this theory. Okay, and this, if you put one extra vertex, it gets finite. Okay, so in other words, this shows us the general situation. If you use this approach based on flat space expansion, okay, and if you accept that all contra terms by the end of the day in all loops, orders, are covariant, then you will see the following. There are infinitely many new diagrams, but the diagrams which you need to establish the divergences are very, very, few. there are only few of them. For instance, this one, okay? If you calculate one single diagram, you can immediately restore the coefficient of phi square r. You don't need to calculate uh, the diagram with many tails. It is counterproductive, it has no sense, okay? You don't need to calculate this at all because this is finite, okay? So we can have some expectation and actually, the, uh, we can be sure that, first of all, the contra terms in all loops will be local. Second, if you start with this theory, which is renormalizable in flat background, then you introduce H menu in the following way. Or you put extra vertices, which always decrease the uh, index of divergence of the diagram, the superficial degree of divergence of the diagram. Or you append these new tails to the existing vertex, which does not change the superficial degree of divergence of the diagram. In other words, if your theory was renormalizable in flat background, it will be still renormalizable in curved background if you introduce the non-minimal term. This works for lambda phi 4, and in fact, it works for any theory because this logic uh, works perfectly well for any theory. And the last example, which I want to consider, is the vacuum diagram, the vacuum diagram, okay? The vacuum diagram uh, is very, very primitive. Let's say one loop. By the way, you can practice with two loop diagrams if you want as an exercise. And no, don't make calculations. Just check that adding new vertices, you transform two loop diagrams to less divergent diagrams or equally divergent diagrams, okay? Or if you are very serious about this, uh, find two loop diagrams which gives you R phi square divergence, okay? Which is a good exercise, and very easy, by the way. So in flat background, we have this one loop diagram, which is irrelevant. It is usually included into normalization factor of the uh, uh, functional integral. And here things change because it is quite a quartically divergent. We know that it is. Uh, if you use cutoff, it will be uh, force power of cutoff. And now it becomes, first you have still the same diagram, but, but on the top of that you have this. Okay? This diagram is quadratically divergent. Okay? This diagram, you can check it. It is quadratically divergent. But it is still not very interesting. Let's go to the next one. And the next one is this. This joke is not bad. 
<laughs> but uh, there is no problem, okay. So this, this diagram is logarithmically diverted, right? And next, the next one, is finite because there are three propagators, one single integral, okay? So let us concentrate on the logarithmically divergent diagram. What we see is the following. It is logarithmically divergent, but the overall dimension is four, okay? So what it means? It means that this diagram gives you four derivatives of the metric in the divergence, okay? Because dimension does not disappear. So you put two vertices, the H menu field has no dimension at all, so there will be this counterterm. And this means automatically that in the counterterms you will have square of the Riemann tensor, square of the Ricci tensor, R square, and box R is difficult to get in this formulation. Okay? Once again, we see that covariance, covariance requires that, that uh, we actually need only this diagram. Okay, but we have to believe in order to use this, we have to believe to covariance, believe to covariance. Uh, maybe I stop today. I'm, I actually did not finish, I think. Maybe, maybe, maybe I finished. I, wait a second. No, I, I did not finish the first lecture. But, okay, we, anyway, it's time to stop. I think people are crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did not prove the covariance, but it's no problem even without Batarin Volkowski in these complicated things because next lecture I will show you explicitly covariant technique of calculations which we can just uh, avoid even thinking about covariance and just have covariant result automatically for divergences at least. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, so we have time for, before that, let me just, uh, I would like everybody to ask everybody to stay here because we want to take a, a picture uh, at the end uh, after we have questions. So we take one picture today and one at the end of the mini course and so to see how many people survived. No, I'm kidding, just, just uh, today. Um, anyway, so but please, uh, if there are any questions, uh, we, can, we have a few minutes. So in the same classical limit, the claim is you only need to go to second order in curvature to get an renormalizable theory. Exactly. Okay. And it but is, it is uh, in all loop orders. It's at all loop orders. Of course, I did only one loop, but it's not, of course, because if you have two loop diagram, for instance, you have, uh, say, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this diagram, okay? Uh, it is two-loop diagram for lambda phi 4, which is logarithmically divergent. The external integral is logarithmically divergent. As far as you add one vertex like that, it goes fine. Right, right. Okay. But then if you quantize H menu, then I have to go to higher orders, right? Sorry, what? If you quantize the metric as well. No, you, uh, I, I know, I know, no, I know. You're no, not I will that. not discuss You're not it doing now. that. I'm sorry. I, I know, I know. I'm just asking. So if you, if you quantize matter fields, and H menu yeah. around Minkowski or any other background. No, no, sorry. Then, then no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Here you have to quantize uh, around Minkowski because it's by definition you have to quantize around Minkowski in this case. Right. Okay, right. if you want to do it different, you have to do it different. But in here you have to quantize it around Minkowski. Okay? okay. Now, ah, good, maybe it's a good question by the end of the day. I, I, I'm starting to think that this is a good question. Look. It's very, very important to understand what is the difference in this formalism between classical field G menu and quantum field phi. And the difference is extremely important because classical field H never ever enters into internal line of the diagram. As far, for example, if you calculate a correction to the propagator of scalar field, okay? Then you have, at one loop, you have three diagrams. One is this one. Uh, to, uh, you, you calculate a correction to the graviton propagator. Okay, at one, at one loop you have this diagram. This is matter loop. 
Then you have this diagram. OK? And then you have this diagram. OK? The point is that this diagram you have to exclude because this is internal line of H menu. If you have internal lines of H menu, then this is quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. OK? So if we start doing here quantum gravity, so we quantize H menu, all these considerations which I gave you uh, don't work. You have to make more serious analysis, including internal lines of H menu. OK? And in principle, uh, the results don't change. <laughs> in this particular case. But for this end, you have to introduce these guys to the, uh, to the action. Right. Okay? right. OK. Thank you. And this has price to pay, so it's not, uh, it's not very, we will discuss it in fourth lecture. Any further questions? Everything was very clear, I guess. Or people are hungry. Okay, so let's uh, thank Ilya, and then, uh, as I said, so um, work on the on the homework, uh, the exercises, and uh, so I, I guess Ilya will be during the day here. Uh, I, I think case. I will leave about 3 p.m. Okay, uh, but, maybe uh, even stop half okay, past. But, okay, but for tomorrow, if somebody wants really to discuss, I will stay. No problem. All okay. right. So let's uh, thank uh, Ilya, and we can meet tomorrow.